you so much for coming. We have a wonderful night for you tonight, as I'm sure you know. I was walking over um, through Central Park today, and I realized oh, I was getting ready to introduce uh, Lawrence Wright and Ali Supan, and I was remembering how many times uh, they have either been here or elsewhere together. And I was thinking that somebody someday should write the story of their friendship <coughs> because <laughs> it's actually very unusual. And they come together, they go apart, but they've been very important to one another's lives. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation, which is in a way an unmoderated conversation that they can talk about what's interested them for the past 25 years, longer than most people who are in the terrorism business these days. These two have been paying attention to Al-Qaeda, other forms of jihadist terrorist groups, and to ISIS. And so this promises to be a very rich uh, and rewarding conversation. A couple of thanks are in order before we get started. Uh, first, I want to thank Christy Penoyer, who's with us tonight who has, through the Bullet Foundation, been funding the center for about a dozen years, and she's here tonight, and I never get a chance to thank her, so thank you very much, Christy. Um, I also want to thank all of you. Um, a number of you in the audience tonight have been supporting the center regularly, and for that, because I don't tell you personally, I am deeply appreciative. If you'd like to know, most of the things that I use personal donations for are events like this. All of our other funding is for projects, it's for events, it's for research projects, but this is really on you, so thank you, and I hope that you will continue to support us the way you have been. Um, I'd also like to mention what's happening next week. This is actually the first in a series. Um, next week is gonna be the second in a series of rethinking terrorism, looking at where we've come from and what's facing us in, in the future in terms of uh, threats. And so next week we're gonna have Gilles Capel, who has a new book on terror that is just out in France as well as in the United States, and Robert Worth, who wrote the New York Times Magazine piece on, um, on Gia, will also be here, and that is going to be uh, Tuesday at lunch on um, March 9th. So it should be a lot of fun, and after these two weeks, you should know a lot about uh, terrorism, and maybe we'll all be calmed down. I'm not really sure. Uh, so <laughs> let me introduce uh, our guest formally. <coughs> Lawrence Wright is the author most, um, in terms of this sphere of activity, uh, most notably for The Looming Tower. If there is any book anybody in this country is going to read on 9-11, it's going to be The Looming Tower. And by the way, I'm sure you've all read it, but just in case you haven't, you're also going to enjoy it. It is it, just a, a, a wonderful book that is destined to go on uh, and to be read for years and years to come. But he's also written many other books um, on Scientology, on um, <coughs> recent terror years, and I could go on. But the thing I want to talk about about Larry today is also about Ali, which is that tomorrow uh, they begin filming with director Alice Gibney, who's also with us tonight, a new series for Hulu, which is a dramatic um, take, or comes out of, of the Looming Tower. So we have a lot to look forward to, and we're not gonna exactly talk about that tonight, but it should be wonderful. <coughs> and who is the star of the Looming Tower, and I assume of the series, although nobody's invited me to read any scripts, uh, I'm sure <laughs> is, um, is Ali Soufan. Ali Soufan is, has been a dear friend, as you know, of the center for ages. His book, The Black Banners, is one of the best books on not just Al-Qaeda, but on the United States and how it responded to the war on terror. This new book, The Anatomy of Terror, is, a, so other people can say what they think it is, but what I think it is, is a wake-up call and a way of saying, look, I know there's a lot of chatter out there, I know there's a lot of stakes out there in terms of um, how much security we need to have and what real threats are, but this is a book that says, Let's take a step back. Let's know what we know about the geopolitical stakes. Let's know what we know about the players in the world. And guess what's happened? And guess what I think the future of the world looks like from the point of view of a terrorism expert. And so that's what you're gonna learn about tonight. So I'm not gonna be like, um, I don't wanna like be a spoiler. So I'm not gonna tell you the rest. So um, afterwards, there will be um, a reception in the back. There will be about 15 minutes for a Q&A. 
um, and I turn the speakers over to you. Al-Qaeda's banner, it's called Hayat Tahrir Sham or HTS, 
they got about 20,000. Uh, they have tanks, they have armies, they have equipment that Osama bin Laden never knew. Well, he will have in his wellness journey. AQIM, which stands for Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, they always struggle <coughs> to um, have different tribal and different um, ethnic organizations working together under uh, the leadership, the Arab leadership of Abu Musab Abdel Madud, who is an Algerian. Recently, the Fulanis, the Tawariks, the Arabs all get together and pledge bayah to the Wahiri through Abu Musab Abdel Madud in Algeria, who is the local um, you know, franchise leader for Al Qaeda uh, in, in, in the Sahel region and uh, in, in North Africa. Um, the problems in, in, uh, in, in, in Libya uh, contributed to Al Qaeda uh, growing its network uh, by having different affiliates. They call themselves AQIM or they call themselves Ansari Sharia. So we see them expanding. We see these local affiliates focusing locally, taking advantage of these political and these, uh, sorry, the geopolitical <coughs> conflicts, these sectarian conflicts that's happening in some places, tribal conflicts that's happening in other places, ethnic conflicts that's happening in, in places, taking advantage of them and, and, and rebuilding Al-Qaeda's brand and Al-Qaeda's network. J.I. in Southeast Asia. J.I. on the eve of the uh, Bali bomb, the famous Bali bomb, they had 31 radical schools, like radical madrasas. This is where they take kids, who are as old as four or five years old, and they brainwash them for years. All the terrorist attacks that we had in the region were connected to people who went to these madrasas. JI in Indonesia today have 66 radical madrasas. So you can see how the organization is rebuilding itself. Some of the members are actually getting out of jail. Um, there is a person, his name is Yazid Sofat. Larry yeah. knows a lot about Yazid Sofat. Yazid Safad was uh, in charge of the chemical program for Al-Qaeda at one point. But also at the same time, Yazid Safad was um, the terrorist who hosted the 9-11 hijackers, some of them, in his villa, in his apartment in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur. And he went to Cal State, right? Yep, yep. So Yazid Safad was released from jail um, for his crimes that led to 9-11. And they arrested him again a uh, few years ago because he was uh, basically recruiting people and sending them to Syria. And now in July, they have to release him from jail again. So the JI network is getting some of the leaders uh, back. So we see that all over the place. And we see that there is an ideology. And unfortunately, in our way of thinking, we always target the threat as we knew it when we start fighting it. Mm. Al-Qaeda mutated. Al-Qaeda mutated so many different times. Osama bin Laden, after he had a huge defeat in the Jalalabad battle back um, after the Soviet Jihad, he was kicked out of Afghanistan. He went back to Saudi Arabia, then he escaped Saudi Arabia, and he went to Syria. Then they had, we had, we had pressure, uh, us and many of our allies, we pressured the Sudanese government to get him out of Sudan. He left Sudan, and everybody thought, okay, that's the end of Al-Qaeda. But Al-Qaeda changed it. It was the end of Al-Qaeda as it existed in Sudan. In Afghanistan, it mutated. It created alliances with the Taliban. It became a terrorist organization that's commanding and controlling terrorist attacks around the world, to include the East African Embassy bombing, to include the U.S. Escort, and to include 9-11. After 9-11, we responded swiftly. We destroyed Al Qaeda's structures in Afghanistan. We destroyed their communication capability. We, we destroyed their <coughs> command and control. And many of their leaders were either killed or in jail. Osama bin Laden himself was able to escape. But Al Qaeda mutated. So now Al Qaeda is not a chief operator. Now Al Qaeda became a chief motivator. Al Qaeda became a message. And Osama bin Laden was trying to, to instigate Al-Qaeda's narratives from his hideouts. And as you will see in the book, he wasn't kind of like, you know, isolated from his commanders. He micromanaged his commanders what to do, what kind of strategy to adapt at what stage. He managed, he micromanaged even the affiliates. He told, for example, the uh, uh, Shabaab, which is the affiliate in Somalia, he said, look, 
you have to plant these kind of trees, you have to build these kinds of dams, you have to have these kinds of water for this kind of uh, product. He was telling them, he was micromanaging exactly what they did. And when they start applying Sharia in a harsh way that isolated some of the tribes, he basically told them, look, you're making my brand look bad. Come on, don't, don't apply Sharia that harshly. Um, AQIM, he was very interested in AQIM, but he understood that most of these guys don't know Al-Qaeda the way he wanted them to know Al-Qaeda. Most of them were Takfiri local groups working against the Algerian government. Uh, they were not interested in the global jihad. So he wanted to take their oath of allegiance after 9-11. He uh, included them to operate under Al-Qaeda's banner, but also at the same time, he wanted to teach them how to be real Qaeda members. So he ordered a Sahab, which is the uh, media agency for Al-Qaeda. He ordered them to translate all Al-Qaeda's strategies and messages to French, because those guys won't know how to read Arabic. So he was micromanage, uh, micromanaging these affiliates. Um, in his hideouts in Afghanistan, and you were in, in sorry, in, in, in Pakistan, and you will read about it in the book, he was, uh, you know, um, talking to uh, or, or writing uh, Abu uh, Basir al-Yemeni, who is the famous leader for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He was actually basically telling him which tribes he can create alliances with, which tribe not to create alliances with, which area to control, what to do. Um, you know, at one point, Al-Qaeda uh, kidnapped some, some uh, French tourists. He was micromanaging the negotiations between uh, Al-Qaeda and between uh, the uh, French government. Going to, to, to basically what to do is that like, even if they don't listen, uh, look at the guy who is the most uh, unimportant individual and just kill him. So Sarkozy can listen, can know that we're serious. Um, it, you know, uh, when Al Qaeda at one point um, negotiated uh, a hostage release, and they made a lot of money out of hostages, by the way, uh, with the Afghani uh, government. Basically, Al Qaeda, uh, uh, Taliban, uh, kidnapped an Afghan. Um, uh, individual or diplomat who was connected to uh, Karzai. So uh, Al Qaeda bought that guy from Taliban and started to negotiate uh, for his release. And they got a few million dollars uh, for him. So when they told Bin Laden, he was very suspicious. He said, Why the heck the Afghani government is interested in this guy that they pay millions of dollars? This is the Americans who are paying the money. And maybe the Americans are paying the money not because they like Karzai but they probably put something in the money to track it, to see where it's going. So I want you to do this. You take the money to different places. You, 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 you have it uh, uh, um, cashed into euros, and then you take it to another place, and you have it into dollars, and, and, and then you take it and you buy gold. He was like actually recycling the money. He was micromanaging the organization. So when he died, you know, definitely there was a vacuum in the organization. But al Qaeda already started a shift, and started a shift that Bin Laden led. And that shift was to start focusing locally. And that shift that Al Qaeda now is an ideology, is a narrative that's get, that 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 uh, is going to take advantage of the vacuums that existed in the Arab Spring. And they actually took credit for these vacuums. Bin Laden said, "Hey, the blast attacks on 9/11, meaning what happened in New York." And might happen in Pennsylvania and Washington. He said, these attacks are the reason that America is not trying to help Mubarak and Gaddafi and all these dictators in the region. <coughs> these are, this is the reason. <coughs> now America is scared. This is phase one. Phase two is how can we create chaos? How can we create vacuum and guarantee that no one else can fill the vacuum? And he wrote that to his commanders. And he told them, everything I told you before, even about the war in Afghanistan, even about doing terrorist attack against the West and the United States, Jesus, just forget about it. Now we have to focus on this stage. We went from one stage to another stage. And that's exactly what Al-Qaeda is doing. And guess what? That order that he gave before the Navy SEALs bullets took him down changed the whole political and power structure in the Middle East. And that's the reason we have the chaos, or part of the reason we have the chaos that we have today. You know, uh, 
Well, you mentioned the stages, and it, it naturally brought to mind uh, Abu Bakr Naji's book, The Management of Savagery, which is a kind of <coughs> field, field manual for <coughs> Al Qaeda and for ISIS. And, uh, and also, there's uh, the Fuad Hussein book, uh, biography of Zarqawi, where they lay out uh, a 20 year plan. And uh, you know, these are both really remarkable documents, but it speaks about this turning point from Al Qaedaism to Isisism or Islamism, something that comes from me. <laughs> but uh, you could you could see that in that in those books that they were talking about the use of barbarity uh, and uh, terror at a scale that has never in modern times been employed. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that evolution from Al Qaeda to ISIS. Well. I think from an ideological perspective and what uh, you know, we, we're talking about here, ISIS and Al-Qaeda are actually the same. Remember, ISIS is a branch of this poisonous tree that's called Al-Qaeda. ISIS used to be Al-Qaeda in Iraq um, when uh, they called themselves the Islamic State of Iraq. When the Syrian war happened, they sent a couple of their commanders. Uh, one of them was Syrian. His name is Abu Muhammad al-Julani to go and participate in the Syria war. Uh, when Julani went to Syria, he realized, you know what? The Syrian Jihad should be separate of the uh, Iraqi Jihad. In a nutshell, Baghdadi, who was the head of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, told him, no, 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 no. You are part of my group, and now we're not the Islamic State of Iraq. We're going to add and Syria, or and Sham. And that's why we call it ISIS, I-S-I-S. Uh, Giovanni did not agree. They thought that there is uh, different dynamics uh, that uh, forced them to separate the two jihads. They went uh, to take the advice and the judgment of Al-Qaeda leadership, which at the time the media was calling it Khorasan. Uh, so they went to Zawahiri to ask his, his, uh, his judgment on this. Now, interestingly enough, all these things were happening publicly. All these things were happening in audio tapes that were released either by Baghdadi or by Jelani. So Zawahiri, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically said, yes, I agree with Jelani. Al-Qaeda in Syria is very different than Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, Baghdadi said, and can you tell me who the hell you are to tell me that uh, this is different? Uh, by the way, you're hiding. You give a bayah to a guy that nobody's seen, Mullah Omar. I have a state and I'm going to announce a caliphate, and you cannot do anything about it, and now you have to give me bayah. And that is basically the original uh, you know, uh, conflict that separated ISIS from Al-Qaeda. Some people went with ISIS, some people continued to stay with Al-Qaeda. As for the savagery that, 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 that we see in the management of savagery with Abu Bakr Naji and other books, the talks about savagery, a lot of times when we hear about savagery, we think, oh, okay, they want to bring somebody and cut their head off, like we've seen on some of the, um, you know, videos, those disgusting videos that they put, and definitely that's part of it. But the management of savagery, the meaning of the management of savagery, is basically, according to Abu Bakr Naji, who's a strategist for Al-Qaeda, is basically how uh, the Roman Empire was taken down. So uh, the Romans considered any area that's not under their control totally a savage zone. So basically, all these zones start rebelling against the empire, and then the empire was destroyed. So this is basically their vision to how they will destroy the Roman Empire of the 21st century, which in their mind is the United States. So you have to create these zones, and you have to create uh, conflict in these zones, savagery in these zones, and you, and only you, can control it. So basically, what we've seen in Syria today, what we, well, what you see in, in, in part of Iraq, what you see in Yemen, it's it's all, actually all, all, all similar. When that happens, and when you create that uh, area towards the end, I mean, Bin Laden actually told his commanders, he said, "Look, what I'm telling you to do, that means a lot of Muslims have to die." And then he writes, well, we have to kill them to save them. We have to kill them to save them. He repeated it twice, right? So, so basically, uh, you have the situation, basically, you have the situation today, and, uh, in, and only after you finish the second stage, 
you go to the third stage in establishing a state, an Islamic state, and the final confrontation of the West. So what we see today is them operating freely under the radar with us not paying attention because we're focused on this shiny thing that's called, shiny ob uh, ob object that's called ISIS. They are doing their stage three. So now we have a choice. Do we wait for them to be at their full strength? And then we have the war after they attack us? Or should we start destroying and diminishing the incubating factors that's feeding into their networks in all these different areas? We've seen that before. We've seen that before. And unfortunately, our government always, um, you know, was, was always perfect to take a wrong decision. You know, that's the only thing that they can do all the time. When somebody like um, John NSF was screaming about in New York, and John is one of my heroes, I learned so much from him, he's, uh, he's here. John, you did more to this city and to this country than anyone else. Can you stand up, please? I want to salute you. When John NSF was telling people here in the FBI and telling people in headquarters, look, there is this guy, the blind sheikh, Omar Abdurrahman. He's not, he, he's up to no good. He's trying to, oh, no, 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 no. These guys are our friends. We supported them in Afghanistan against the Soviets. Come on, yeah, nothing's gonna happen. Then the bombing happened, the 1993 World Trade Center bombing happened. And then they start listening to John and because of, 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 of his work and because of the work of so many people on the Joint Terrorism Task Force, now suddenly people in the Department of Justice and other, uh, you know, other, other places in the US government start listening to them and they gave them the resources that they needed and they stopped the big terrorist attack that's called Terror Stop. I don't know how many people are familiar with Terror Stop, but Terror Stop was, uh, you know, the uh, a terrorist plot headed by the blind sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. They wanted to blow up bridges and tunnels, 26 Federal Plaza, which is the FBI building, and the UN. And, 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 and they were actually, they stopped them when they were mixing the bomb. There is CCTV photos of them mixing the bomb, planning everything, and it wasn't, uh, and they were probably able to do it if finally the government started to listen to people like John and his colleagues at the time. And then the same thing after the East African Embassy bombing. What did we do? We launched 73 Tomahawk missiles on, on Afghanistan. We hit the pharmaceutical kind of company in Sudan. It's like, okay, you know, that's gonna make it okay now. You know, nothing is gonna happen. And we had the USS call. You know what? We didn't even retaliate for the USS call. Those 17 sailors that were killed in Aden on October 12th of uh, 2000, nobody cared about them. Uh, let's be honest. Nobody cared about them. Um, you know, and, and when we were trying to push for an indictment against Osama bin Laden, they didn't want. Because you know what? This is happening so far away. This is happening overseas. And guess what? That's exactly what's happening now. That's exactly what's happening now. It's happening in Yemen, it's happening in Syria, it's happening in Somalia, it's happening in, 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 in southern Algeria, it's happening in Mali, it's happening in South Philippines, it's happening in Indonesia. Why should I care? Guess what? You pay now or you pay later, but you're gonna pay. So let's talk a little bit about strategy in that case. Um, you know, we have, we've had some successes, but they've been tactical. Uh, Overall, uh, Al Qaeda hasn't been defeated. The idea of Al Qaeda has prospered and spread. Uh, so, how do you how do you contain and diminish and eventually eliminate such an entity? Well, that's a that's a very good question. And um, since 9/11, and even before 9/11, we always had amazing tactical successes. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have strategy. So all these tactical successes can actually lead to a strategic uh, failure. And we've seen that in Vietnam too. You know, we, we never lost the battle in Vietnam, but we lost the war, right? So, um, so what's happening, we are confusing, and this is not one single administration, this is few administrations in the last few decades, we always confuse tactics with the strategy. So when we get a tactic that we like, we start using it and we say, okay, you know, this is kind of like kicking the can down the road. For example, now we love drones, so anytime we see a couple of terrorists sitting together, we go and we drone them. That's fine. But you know what, it's like the Hydra. 
So you cut ahead, two others gonna come up. You know, you have to basically cut the neck. And the neck is mostly the narrative and the ideology, right? But also at the same time, as we talked earlier, the threat had changed. So now Al-Qaeda is not only a terrorist organization based in one place, like all other terrorist organizations are trying to do attacks. And now it's spread. It's spread all over the place, and it is taking advantage of this sectarian competition. It's actually not even sectarian competition. It's actually, to be more accurate, the geopolitical competition in the region that's using sectarianism and using the religion in order to score points against each other and in, in order to create alliances, right? And both countries who are doing that um, are basically, specifically Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, both these countries are doing it with the mentality of zero sum. Now, who is benefiting from this on the Shia side? Definitely extremist uh, groups, Shia groups. We've seen them in Iraq. We see uh, Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, how we benefited from that. We see their capabilities in Syria. We see all these Shia that's being recruited in Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iraq to go to Syria and fight in Syria. And Syria became like the new Afghanistan for training all these foreign fighters from all these different places, on the Shia side and the Sunni side. And on the Sunni side, Al-Qaeda learned. They have a lot of relationship with other extremists. So for example, in Syria, they set up a group. That group, we can consider a moderate group. And then we start giving them money, we start giving them weapons in order to operate inside Syria. They either have two options. Either they have to give the money or a portion of the money as jizya tax to al-Nusra or to some of these extremist groups. They have to give them some of the money, or guess what? Uh-uh. Uh, they will take it all. <laughs> so you have one option, you know, if, 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 yeah, it is to, to share. Or what al-Nusra did at the very beginning, for example, uh, Abu Khalid al-Suri was a spokesperson. He's one of the strategists for al-Qaeda. He was in jail. Assad released him from jail during their rebellion. So he goes out, and then he started a group with other people who were with him in jail. Uh, called Ahrar al-Sham, uh, the freemen of the Levant. And Ahrar al-Sham, you know, we always knew they have radical connections, but a lot of other countries in the region did not think to include our NATO ally country, uh, our uh, NATO ally country, Turkey. They didn't think, uh, they, were, they thought they were mostly Muslim brotherhood. They are not connected to, to Al-Qaeda or to the Salafi Jihadi movement. Well, later on, um, we found out that a lot of the money and the funding that Abu Khalid al-Suri, and this is part of Treasury documents, Treasury, report, uh, Treasury Department documents that has been released, a lot of the money was basically Khalid al-Suri takes it and he gives it to al-Nusra. So they actually were able, in the terrorism world, to put something like a money laundry operation. So they put a group that, you know, okay, you know, you're, you're good, but then a lot of the money that goes there, it goes to Al-Nusra. So they were able to create amazing uh, capabilities for themselves. Also, they did the same thing in, in many of the different areas. So in order to combat them today, we have to use a different strategy than the strategy we did at the time of 9-11. This strategy has to, has to include political and diplomatic solutions for the Syria conflicts, for the Yemen conflicts, has to, it has to include pressure on regional countries that there is no zero sum game here. And you guys, you know, have been neighbors for thousands of years and you're gonna continue to be neighbors for thousands of years. You have to figure it out. Because towards the end, these countries who are basically encouraging, him, encouraging this uh, kind of behavior, they're gonna be the first to be hit by it when it happens. So we need to have a diplomatic initiative, but also we have to have an economic initiative. Today, for example, we have millions and millions of people from Syria who lost their homes. They live in refugee camps. You know, poor Jordan, they have more refugees than they can handle. You know, the refugees from Iran, where do they go? To Jordan. Refugees from Syria, where do they go? To Jordan. Jordan is small little country, and. You know, arguably, I think, you know, when it comes to security and relationship and counterterrorism, they are our best ally in the region. So when, when, you, have, when you have that, you're starting to create uh, instability in, in the region. But also, more importantly, think about a whole generation, a whole generation of Syrian children 
that have no education. Okay, what do you expect is gonna happen down the road? You know, I, I can guarantee you there are ISIS, Al Qaeda recruiters are basically recruiting in these refugee camps. And remember, we all talk, we, we all know of Taliban, right? Everybody here heard about the Taliban. You know what Taliban means in Pashti? Students. You know why they call them students? Because those are the kids who were in refugee camps in Pakistan, and we decided that, you know what, we defeated the Soviets, who cares about these refugees, let's leave, right? And they were brainwashed and radicalized, and I hope 9-11 woke you up, right? So that is what we need to do. We have to have three different components, military and intelligence and law enforcement, this is always on the table. But we need more importantly than that today because we cannot solve the conflict in Syria with military means. We cannot solve the conflict in Yemen in military means. You know, the Saudis are using every kind of weapon you can imagine. You, you cannot just use military means to solve these conflicts. We need to have political and diplomatic uh, solutions for these conflicts. And that will take the oxygen away from this threat, right? then we have to be ready for the next stage. We cannot just wait for the next stage to fly into the World Trade Center. You know, we have to stop it before it comes to us. You know, Audrey Kurth Conan is a, a student of terrorist movements at George Mason University. And she studied hundreds of, of different groups to see how they end. And uh, I, I think that there were six uh, destinies for terror groups, one is success, because occasionally terror groups like Irgun uh, succeed. Uh, one is that uh, they fail, and that's the destiny of almost all terrorist yeah. groups. Uh, one is they turn to another form, like politics or crime. A FARC would be an example, maybe. A Taliban could become a criminal organization given its dependence on opium. Uh, and, and one is negotiation, uh, like the IRA. Uh, and, and then there's massive repression, uh, which uh, it seems that for our country, we haven't been able to figure out any of those possible destinies except failure, and we can't figure out how to make them fail. Uh, I was a little discouraged to find out that religious groups are more persistent. The average lifespan of a, a terror group, according to her, is seven years. Of course, Al Qaeda is 29. Yeah. And uh, but there was one religious group called uh, the Thugs. That's where the word comes from in India. It lasted 600 years. So uh, we don't want to contemplate it. But uh, but it is more than a generational struggle. And uh, do you see? And the end in sight in, in, in any form for this um, struggle with Al Qaeda? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think if we have uh, us and our allies a comprehensive strategy, and a lot of uh, countries in the world start realizing they cannot use these uh, groups as pawns in their schemes and in their battles against each other, um, I think uh, we can uh, see these organizations weakening. Um, look, you know. Uh, these, the problem in, 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 in the West in general, that every time we want to do something, we need a checklist. We need a strategy that works in Brooklyn, and it works in Tunisia, and it works in Yemen. That's not how it works. There is no cookie cutter approach. And uh, some places, uh, the radicalization is based on economic and poverty. Yeah, maybe. Some places, based on religion. Yeah, maybe. It might be based on religion. Some places it's just based on chaos and the lack of alternatives. Some places it's based on sectarianism. Al Qaeda is increasing their numbers in Yemen, not because just uh, now people are more, uh, you know, they find some of the land more appealing. Uh, because a lot of Sunni areas in Yemen, uh, they trust Al Qaeda to defend them against the Shia Azais. <laughs> but it's, it's actually as simple as that. Um, you take the sectarianism issue out, and uh, I think, um, you know, a lot of people have not bought into the whole ideological thing that Al Qaeda, the whole package of Al Qaeda brings with them. So I think, look, you know, if we start solving these political things, is, is, is these, these, these conflicts, this military conflict, 
uh, I don't think Al Qaeda will continue. And in, uh, in history, we had, I mean, you mentioned the plugs in India, but also, you know, everybody know the word assassins, right? Because assassins are the people who assassinated people, who are people assassination. So the, actually, assassins is basically a, a terrorist group that existed in the Middle East. <laughs> and uh, they used to call them, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the Latin term became assassin. So we continue to call, you know, basically anyone who kill anyone for political reason or anything assassinations or assassins. Uh, but they were a terrorist organization. And a lot of people in the Middle East tried to do the counter narrative against the assassin. They called them hashashun. Hashashun means that, you know, those people who are puppets, they smoke drugs. Because they saw that the leader, Al Hassan Sabah, um, used to uh, make his uh, people smoke uh, marijuana and hashish, and then they start seeing heaven and paradise, so they were willing to do whatever he ordered them to do. Uh, but actually, scholars who looked into this, they said that basically that is not, uh, that is not the truth. Um, they are called assassins because it's, it comes from the Arabic word assas. Assas means fundamental. So they were fundamentalists. So they are assassiyun which is the fundamentalists, as we call them today. Uh, Assas is the fundamentals and the roots of the religion. And, uh, and Hassan Sabah uh, died, but uh, the organization survived more than 100 years after his death. They created so many different, so many chaotic situations in the Middle East. Uh, there was a story about them that Salat, the great leader of the Middle East who liberated Jerusalem uh, you know, uh, from the Crusaders, uh, he had enough of them assassinating people, so he actually sent the troops uh, to, uh, and this is way after Sabah died, to surround the mountain that they were in northern Syria, where the battles are now, actually. And, uh, and uh, the assassins sent a messenger to talk to Salah, and so he goes in and he uh, said to Salah, and I have a message from my leader, Salah, and told him, uh, yeah, tell me the message. And he said, no, it's, uh, it's just me and you. So Salah then ordered everyone in his room, uh, in, in his meshes, in his uh, place, to leave except two bodyguards that they never leave them. They have been with him forever. So the person said, uh, well, everyone. He said, they don't leave. He said, okay, uh, I want you to leave from here, that's the message, to break the siege or I'm gonna kill you. Then Salah then stopped laughing. <laughs> Are you kidding? You want to kill me? <laughs> I'm surrounding you. I'm going to crush you. Um, and uh, he said, how are you going to kill me? And the guy, the messenger from the assassin's leader, went like this to the two bodyguards. They took their swords and they put it on the neck of Salah. Assassins used to put people in place for years and years and years. And then they do the assassination. So those guys are not drug addicts. Those are true believers. So I think, in, so we have this in, in history, and we have this in Islamic history, these kinds of groups who are people who are so dedicated to the way of thinking, to, 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 to what they believe in. And, but, but there was reasons that they existed. There was political and economic and cultural and sectarian factors that pushed them to be where they are. But we need to actually, in the 21st century, start dealing with this. Unfortunately, we're always behind the sea on it, behind, behind the eight ball on it. And the reason we are behind the eight ball because we try to think not like them, but we think like us, right? So, when 9-11 happened, the, not, there was a 9-11 commission and they actually called the 9-11 attack a failure of the imagination. Remember, that's what they said, it's a failure. Because they said every time they talk to any um, person in, uh, in the intelligence community, they said you could not imagine fly, uh, uh, planes flying into a building, right? Um, when Wolfowitz was testifying in front of Congress, um, he, uh, he said that he, does, he cannot imagine it will take more troops to secure post-Saddam Iraq than to take down Saddam. We cannot imagine. Well, you know what? Our imagination is always limited. It's limited by so many different factors. It's limited by our own experiences. It's limited by our own prejudices. It's limited by, you know, um, our own ideologies, our own views of the world, right? It's limited. 
So instead of just focusing on imagination, I think we need to expand our imagination with empathy. Remember, I said empathy, not sympathy. You know, empathy is what makes us, and I don't mean empathy in, 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 um, in uh, uh, colloquial sense. I mean empathy in, 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 in clinical sense, right? So empathy is what's going to make us, you know, see the world through the eyes of the enemy. Know what they motivate them, what motivates them, uh, what makes them dead, what makes them angry, what makes them happy, how do they recruit people. Only when we get into that level of intimacy about the enemy, we're going to start winning. <clears throat> Unfortunately, 17 years after 9-11, and we're not there yet. We don't know much about the people that we're targeting. We're not, we don't know much about the people that we're, we're fighting. We don't know about, about it on, 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 on such a level that can match what Sun Tzu told us many, many years ago. Know your enemy and know yourself. You will win a hundred times in a hundred battles. Unfortunately, I mean, you know, we kind of don't know much about our enemy, but we forget who we are. We forget about our principles and our values. And guess what? <laughs> Sun Tzu is right. That's why it has been a disaster. So, I just want to frame this question by summing up some of the things that you referenced. You know, we're in a tidal wave of refugees. Five million Syrians outside of their own country. It's just a part of the global refugee Not to crisis. Mention Yemen. Yeah, what Afghanistan, Iraq, and it is the, the, the world is awash more than any refugees since World War II. According to UNICEF, half of them are children. Uh, this, there's no single cause of terrorism. There's just, you know, I just call it a river of despair. And you know, all these things are tributaries into, you know, poverty, lack of opportunity, lack of education, gender apartheid, autocracy. They, you, know, you can separate each of them and say, that must be it, but it's not. No. It's all of it. And so these, you have this, massive tidal wave of refugees that are capsizing the demographics of our allies in the region, unsettling Europe, and changing the country that we are. Uh, so I think when we talk about empathy, what I see is the pendulum going the opposite way. There's so much fear and anxiety and, uh, and casting out the, you know, the idea of sympathy at all. Any, any kind of understanding is stigmatized, that if you project yourself into that you know, just expel them, build a wall. You know, and that seems to be the direction we're going that is so far away from being able to approach the, the kind of solution you're talking about. And, and that's why we need to know more. We need to arm ourselves with facts. We need to understand the conflicts we are fighting. And we need to provide solutions that can work for our future, that can work for our national security, not that looks good when you say it on, on, on uh, you know, during a political speech. I mean, you know, we have to separate demagoguery from national security. If you want to connect demagoguery and national security together, you're going to have a disaster. A lot of the people throughout history who connected them together ended up with a huge failure. Um, I, I think uh, people will feel good about it. People sometimes will, will feel secure about rhetoric. Oh yeah, let's battle Muslims. Okay, you know, fine. But how, how this is going to work? Uh, when Al Qaeda put it on the cover of their, actually, and they did, on their <coughs> newspaper. You know, how this is going to work when it's featured in an ISIS, uh, you know, a propaganda video. Um, you know, they tell the Muslims that, hey, you know what, you cannot be uh, a good Muslim unless you're one of us, because there's only us and that there's all the infidels, and there's nothing in between. And basically, we're telling them, yes, it's true. Um, and I think. Something that we forget about, and something that our fearless leaders uh, forget about, that the people who are combating everything that I said now in the Middle East are Muslims. The people who are combating ISIS in Iraq or in Syria, Muslims. The people who are combating, um, you know, uh, uh, Al Qaeda in, uh, in in Yemen, Muslims. The people who are combating them in uh, the Sahel, Muslims. So, how do you want these people to feel when you say that? Oh. The religion is terrorism, you know? Um, why, why is he gonna fight against that? He's like, you know what? 
<laughs> Who cares? I'll join them. You know. Um, so I think we have to be very careful about our narrative. Very careful about our uh, uh, because this is this is this is the most important thing in in defeating this this uh, this message. Remember, it's not an organization anymore. It is a message. And, uh, and, and, and we need to counter that message, and we need to counter it in a, diplomatically, we need to counter it uh, in building relationships and alliances around the Muslim world, we need to counter it in creating allies, and, and have more people in our team, not in their team, and, uh, and we need to basically stick to the facts on all this kind of stuff, you know? Uh, the fear of refugee, you know how many people who basically were killed in the United States because of a refugee, you know, terrorism, terrorism attack because of refugees. How many people? Refugees, I'm talking, not immigrants, not refugees. Zero, zero. So what is all the fear? I mean, it makes it makes good TV. It makes people feel, oh, I am tough. Look at me, you know. I when I look at my, myself in the mirror, I know I'm a chicken hog. But look at me, I'm tough. I'm gonna bang. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. Unfortunately, this is not the way it goes, and uh, and I think that is feeding into the narrative of extremism. Let's talk about one specific dilemma, which is Syria, uh, which is sort of the red hot center right now, and uh, it's painfully obvious that we have no strategy there, and uh, yet you know this is creating a, a, a well armed and well trained cadre of future terrorists to go back out into the world. How should, uh, what should American stance be there? Well, you know, it's very difficult because um, we, we kind of missed so many um, opportunities in the Syrian civil war. So now, unfortunately, we have uh, very few options on the table, and all these options are bad. Um, and, and that's why I think that we have to push for a political solution. And uh, the, uh, uh, the future of the Assad regime should be part of the stuff that's negotiated on the table. Now, Assad is not that powerful in Syria. Those people who are fighting for Assad, from Hezbollah to Iran to Russia, to the Shia militias that they are bringing from everywhere, they really don't care about Assad. They are fighting there for their own interest. They are fighting there for own geopolitical and sectarian interest in the region, in the Levant, right? And the people who are fighting against Assad, unfortunately, this, this rebellion, rebellion started as, as, as a great rebellion of people who just want freedom. But at this point, um, they also fight because they are armed in the interest of regional countries. Every group has somebody who support them, Turkey, yeah, I mean, you name it. You know, all, all and us, <laughs> every country has has groups that they support. And unfortunately, now this conflict is not a Syrian conflict anymore. This is the reality of it. It is a regional conflict, and it's an international conflict. And only when these players sit on a table, and I understand again, they understand that nobody is going to win that militarily. Only when they sit on the table and they come up with a new kind of mini Yalta for the Middle East. Okay, this Iran, this is your influence. Uh, other states, this is your influence. Uh, you know, other entities, this is your influence. Russia, this is your influence. Uh, only when that happens, uh, we're going to start to see an end to this Syrian war. Um, uh, the people who are fighting on the ground, um, unfortunately, are irrelevant to it has to be a regional and international uh, solution. And that solution cannot be a military, military solution because, my God, then the world will end. We'll have a World War III. It has to be a political solution. I've got to invite some questions from the audience. I understand that there is a microphone. That, uh, there it is, right there. So uh, if, uh, if you'd hand it over here to one of these questioners here, then 